All right, so as previously, we always start with our imports and we're going to basically be using the same imports. We'll get everything from biocompiler. We're going to get NumPy for arrays, PyLab for plotting, Bioscrape is what we'll use to simulate and Pandas stores simulation results. And I'm going to start with an example using enzymes. Um, and I'm going to go through three or four examples here. The, the basic example here is that we have catalysis, which an enzyme plus a substrate goes to an enzyme plus a product with no binding versus Michaelis menti catalysis, where here I have the enzyme bind to the substrate and then get catalyzed. And as I mentioned, biocompiler has this notion of default parameters, so I'm going to define some of those as a dictionary, which is a keyword to a value. And this keyword is the parameter name. If you don't have the right parameters, biocompiler will give you an error, which will tell you the parameter key it's looking for, and you can then add that to your parameters. So next, I'm going to create the underlying species. This is similar to what we did last week. We're going to make E for enzyme, S for substrate, and P for product. And now I'm going to create a component. And this component is actually going to be wrapped around the species E, but I'm going to call it enzyme. So E and enzyme are different. Notice that components are not the same as species. They sort of wrap around species. In fact, the same species can be multiple components. And enzymes need to know their substrate and their product. I now create a mechanism, basic catalysis, which is this. This is built into biocompiler. And I put it in a list. Maybe if I have more mechanisms for my mixture, I'd add more mechanisms to that list. So now I make a mixture. I give that mixture a name. I put my components in it. So the only component I'm talking about is my enzyme. And notice that my enzyme had those three species, E, S, and P, sort of defined into it. So my enzyme is carrying my species to my mixture. I don't have to add them to my mixture at all. I give it my parameters and I give it my mechanisms. And then everything basically in biocompiler can be printed. If you want a more complicated version of something, use the rep r command to really represent it. If you just want to print it and see something very simple, just try print and you can usually see what you're dealing with. So here I see that I have a mixture called catalysis mixture. It has one component, which is an enzyme, and that has one mechanism catalysis. Um, of type catalysis called basic catalysis. I can then compile my chemical reaction network and I can print it out and you'll see that I have one reaction. And I can simulate it the same way we did last week. Once I have a chemical reaction network, it's easy to simulate and you'll see that my substrate goes down, sorry, my substrate goes down and my product goes up while my enzyme remains constant, which is what we expect. Now I can do the same thing with Michaelis menten catalysis. And here the only difference is my catalysis mechanism is now Michaelis menten instead of simple catalysis. I do exactly the same thing. I make a mixture. You notice that my, my mechanism type catalysis is now different and I compile it and I print out the reactions and you'll see that I now have two reactions. One is a reversible binding reaction. The second is the catalysis reaction. This compilation created some species for me. I have this new species complex of ENS which didn't exist before. So that's one of the cool things biocompiler does is it produces species for you. Um, and now if I simulate this, you'll see my dynamics are very different. Here, my product is still going up and my substrate is going down and my enzyme is remaining constant. Actually, it's, it's zero. You'll see it's all in the bound complex, which I'm not plotting for you. Um, and my rate is now linear. Why? Because my enzyme is saturated with my substrate and can only catalyze so much. So I'm working in the saturated michaelis menten regime. And so just by changing one line of code, I can very easily here test out two different mechanisms, two different models of catalysis. And when you're talking about large metabolic networks, that might be important. You might want to think about which regime you're working in and which model makes more sense for you. Now, my next example, and I'm going to try, I'm eating into our workshop time, but that's okay. Uh, I think this is important is a gene that produces an enzyme. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to reuse my same species, ESMP, and make an enzyme. But now I'm going to make a DNA assembly, a different type of component that's going to have a promoter. I'm using strong. This is really just saying it's looking up in a parameter file, which I'll show you in a second, a ribosome binding site, which I'm calling medium for the strength. I'm, it's producing the enzyme 
called species E. So my protein I'm calling E, and I'm giving it some initial concentration for the DNA assembly. This is the gene that produces E. And I put it into this simple TXTL extract. So this is a simple model of an extract, one of the mixtures we have. And you can see that this mixture has simple transcription, simple translation, a basic catalysis a mechanism, and a binding mechanism in it. And it also degrades RNA. This is sort of an idealized model of how extracts work. And in this particular case, I have two different things. I have an enzyme and my DNA assembly in it. And I can compile the CRN, and you'll now see that I have a CRN that both has my catalysis, my basic catalysis mechanism, but also the production of E from my gene. And if I simulate this, you'll see that I get different dynamics than I did before, mostly because initially I start off with no E. So as the amount of enzyme increases, I start really degrading my substrate and producing my products. I could also try doing this in a more complex mixture here. I'm using TXTL dilution mixture and the name is E. coli. This name really matters here because I'm looking up a bunch of parameters in a parameter file. Notice I'm using this parameter file default parameters.txt. This has a bunch of useful parameters for E. coli synthetic biology in particular. And I give it the same two components. So I haven't changed anything here. I'm using a different set of mechanisms. Um, and here you'll see I'm using this transcription Michaelis Menten, translation Michaelis Menten, my catalysis also Michaelis Menten. And I have different types of degradation here. I have RNA degradation via enzymes, and I also have global dilution. And inside I have a bunch of pre-built components. I have RNA polymerase, I have ribosomes, and I have RNAs that sort of come inside of this extract mixture, as well as the gene and gene E and E. And I also have some background DNA representing cellular processes. And this makes a very complicated CRN with 25 reactions and 20 species. You can see it here, which we can print. And it has very different dynamics. You'll see that my substrate remains nearly constant until my there's some lag time before I even start producing enzyme due to transcription translation. Then my amount of substrate plummets and my amount of enzyme, once there's no substrate left, is now free to increase. So by changing the modeling context, I can really change how my uh, system looks. And you can both use these pre-built contexts or you can just use a basic mixture and add your own mechanisms to it. And you can also build your own mechanisms. That's what we want to be advanced tutorials today. So an example, a third example is this toggle switch example, just to show you how promoters work. Um, I've shown you DNA assemblies before where I said my promoter was to be weak. You can also make promoter objects. If you look at, I think, uh, the work, the Jupyter Notebook number four, it talks about gene regulatory networks. There's a whole bunch of promoter models built into biocompiler for different things. Repressible promoter uses a hill function to model repression. So I can make my two species, my repressor A and my repressor B. I can create a promoter, PA, which is repressed by repressor B. And I'll put this into my DNA assembly, which I'm calling A, which has this PA promoter inside of it and produces my repressor A. And I can do the same thing with my promoter B and assembly B. This one is re promoter B is repressed by repressor A. This is the toggle switch. I'll just put this into the DNA assembly in the same way. I now make a mixture. Here I'm using a different mixture, simple TXTL dilution mixture. Dilution mixtures mean there's going to be some sort of degradation by dilution, while extracts typically don't have that. I'll add in my two components and I can print it out. And this is exactly the model I showed you earlier for the idealized bistable toggle switch. And here's some very simple code to plot those trajectories. I simplified the code from the code I used for the lecture to make it fit on one slide, but you can see that you get trajectories where if you start on sort of the right bottom, you go to the right bottom. If you start on the left top, you go to the left top. And if you start on the central line, you sort of stay there. And so finally, my last example is a DCAS9 repressor. This is also an example that I mentioned in the lecture. Here, I want to just show you how to make custom parameters. So I've used parameter files and I've used default parameters. You can also make custom parameters by using this parameter key, where I give something a mechanism name or type. This could also just say transcription, a part ID, and the name of the parameter. And these can be none if you want. And I put this into the dictionary with a value. And that's it. So if I want to make a big parameter dictionary with a whole bunch of parameters, I can just make a bunch of these keys and put them into my parameter dictionary and pass that into my mixture. Alternatively, I can make a, a tab-separated file or a comma-separated file that has 
columns, mechanism, part ID, and name, and value, and that will, and it can read those as parameter files as well. And there's a notebook on parameters if you want to learn more. I think it's notebook number five in the example notebooks folder. So now to make this uh, guide RNA decast repressor, I make three species, the guide, the decast, and the reporter. But I actually have to make some components. I know that my repressor is really a chemical complex formed between my guide and my decast. And I apologize for this. This is extra code. I was testing something that I forgot to remove. So I use this chemical complex to create my repressor. I now make an assembly that produces my decast. And I make an assembly that produces my guide. No, my guide is not a protein. It's a transcript. And I have no RBS, which makes sense, right? And this will all just work. This will be transcribed, but not translated. I now make my regulated promoter, which is repressed by my repressor. And I, I can give it custom parameters here. I give the parameters to my uh, promoter. I could also give the parameters to my mixture. It doesn't, in this case, doesn't make a difference. I put this promoter inside of an assembly that gets repressed and produces my reporter protein. And this is, again, a fairly complicated system because um, I'm putting it into a TXTL dilution mixture that has a lot of things going on. So you have 29 species and 38 reactions to model this. I'm modeling all of the endonucleases and the ribosomes and the polymerases to really make this uh, an, a more accurate model, I guess. I can simulate it. I want to note here, you see this warning. This warning comes up a lot. This just says that your ODE is stiff. If you see ODE failed with max and it keeps going, it'll, it's just trying to figure out the parameters to do the simulation. A lot of chemical reaction networks have this property where they're stiff, which means that you have separation of time scales in your rates, something I'll talk about more um, in two lectures. But you could ignore these, these warnings. They're good to know. This is a sign that maybe you should simplify your model. But if it simulates in the end, you're good. And finally, I get this uh, heat map where I showed you that if you have both guide RNA and decast, you get repression. And if you have just guide RNA, you get activation. And if you have just uh, decast, you get a little bit of repression and a little bit of activation in kind of a, a strange way you might not expect. So that summarizes our lecture.